I'm actually going to reverse a little bit um, the way it was introduced. I'm going to talk to you first about jobs that are available in forensic science. Because some of you are going, after four years, I just want to go get a job. Okay, we'll do that first. And with the major, most of you are in molecular and cellular biology. Okay, good. So we'll start out a little bit with that. But I'll do a little bit of an introduction first. Um, the re before I went to the University of Illinois, I actually was a forensic scientist with the Illinois State Police for 35 years. And after that length of time, they said, you know, you're old, retire. And so I retired on August 16th, or August 15th of 2011. I started my job at the University of Illinois on August 16th of 2011. So my retirement actually was like 12 hours long and I was back in the field again. I actually started out as a drug chemist and moved into toxicology. My PhD is actually in pharmacodynamics, which in theory means I know everything there is to know about drugs and nothing else. Uh, but I've picked up a little bit of everything else on the side. So what we're gonna talk about is why there's a big interest in forensics, why people like forensics, where they get all their information about forensics, and we'll talk about the real jobs in forensics, and then I'll kind of close out with what our program at UIC is all about. So you get forensics on TV, in the media, it's either positive or negative. The positive is all the shows that are on, where they solve every crime in an hour and everything is happy, everybody is perfect, nothing really happens, you know, too bad. And I mean, you know, CSI, all of them, NCIS, Bones, FBI files, autopsy, new detectives, medical tech detectives, forensic files, FBI files, all of them show you the best side of forensics. If you listen to them, you will hear some of them say outlandish things, even on the ones that are real, okay? They actually say weird things sometimes. I actually watched a new detective's once where a person held up a plastic baggie in it that supposedly had a fragment of a human hair and said that he matched that human hair to the human hair from the suspect without DNA. Okay, impossible to do. And if he said that in court, hopefully there's a defense attorney that will, shall we say, take him to task. The, all the shows that are on there are so bad, I watch like 20 seconds at a time and I get disgusted and leave and go watch, I don't know, something more fictitious. Um, but they do try to get across the idea that forensics is a necessity for law enforcement. And it really has become an absolute necessity for law enforcement. A case can't go to court now, especially in murder or sexual assault, where they don't have DNA evidence. If there's no DNA evidence, pff, the jury's gonna vote not guilty. That's just it. And that's what they call the CSI effect. But those are all the positive aspects. If you go to the negative aspects about forensic science, it's mostly in the news. Okay, because you only hear about the bad forensic scientists. You don't hear, you know, and there are, are probably 150 of them throughout history that were bad forensic scientists. You don't hear about the thousands of good ones because nobody cares. Um, but the OJ case, I put that in there because, well, if it weren't for the OJ case, nobody would know about forensic science. Uh, we would still be in our little labs working and nobody would know about us, but Judge Ito put forensics on TV for everybody. And you could watch forensics on the, in the OJ case 24 hours a day. If you didn't have a job, you could watch it you know, while it was going on live. If you had a job and you had to work nine to five, you could actually go on at about six o'clock, you could catch the OJ case replayed with annotation. Okay, you know, they would comment on it. And if you actually had to work until midnight, they would start again at midnight with commentary on the commentary watching the OJ case. So they had hired experts to do that. The Innocence Project proved, they tried to prove that all forensic scientists were bad. All they succeeded in proving was that witnesses are bad. But you can't beat up a witness, especially if you're, you know, in the, the Innocence Project. So what they always said was forensics actually falsely got somebody convicted. And we, the American Academy of Forensic Sciences had them go back and talk about that with the lawyers involved, Neufeld, Dunchek, and all of them. And he said, look at your statistics and tell us where the forensics was bad. And they're like, well, okay, they gave the right statistics, okay? When people were put in jail with, and they later were exonerated, there were two things going against them. Number one was enzyme technology that could say, 
the person who left the seminal fluid or the body fluid behind had an enzymatic profile that limits them to like one in 100,000 people. And the suspect has that same profile. So one in 100,000. Not really very good, um, but it was the best thing that was going at the time. Then you get a, 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 the victim on the stand who says, it's him. What does the jury do? Now they find him guilty. All right. So later when DNA came about, we actually cleared a lot of people, I think at last count 297, across the United States. Seems like a lot, but of all of the tens and tens of thousands of cases, it's not too bad, okay? And it was the best statistics at the time. Now with DNA, as you'll learn, the, the statistics are so immense that we've limited we've you know we've limited people in statistics to like a million times the world population. It's like one in eighteen octillion people is the highest one I've ever heard of. Okay, it's like sorry, you're you've got some rare alleles in those in those genes and only one in 18 octillion people will have the same genetic profile as you and oh by the way the body fluid that was left in the victim same genetic profile as you once you get the jury to understand how big an octillion is compared to the world population they kind of go yeah he's guilty um, there are a lot of uh, like Newsweek articles on bad science uh, there's press on bad scientists. Fred Zane was poster boy for bad science in forensic biology and originally DNA. Uh, there are bad forensic science laboratories. Houston Laboratory had some problems. They've solved those. They're back. The Detroit Laboratory had some problems. They closed. They will never be back. Um, the mayor just closed the Detroit lab and said, I'm going to let Michigan State Police do all of my forensics from now on. So they are. And he had a good reason to close it. They found out that about 30% of the cases going out of the Detroit lab were wrong. So that you want to close that laboratory. So that's the interest. Now, the reality is this. It's not a glamorous job because you spend all of your time in the laboratory. In all of those shows, they go out to crime scenes, they collect evidence, they package it up, they bring it back, they test it. And oh, by the way, they test everything. One week you're watching them do DNA, the next week they're doing fingerprints, then they're doing firearms. The only thing they don't all do is trace analysis. But they're doing everything. They finally develop a suspect, they go out, they arrest the suspect, they bring him in, they beat him up, they get a confession, and it's all done in an hour. Reality is we're in the lab all the time except when we're in court. And I prefer it that way because out on the street there are people with guns who like to hurt other people. Um, leave me in the laboratory to do lab work. We don't interview suspects. We do not drive Hummers. Okay. I just was reading a Scarpetta book where basically she's a medical examiner and she's driving some tricked out Hummer. Um, no, we don't. And the real crime scene people don't drive Hummers either. Uh, we don't look like movie stars. This is it. Uh, it's, uh, sorry. And there are more profilers on TV th than in reality. I know, I, you know none of you are like psychology majors, so you don't have to worry about this. But they actually have more forensic profilers on television than in reality. So if you watch something like Criminal Minds, realize that there are about on screen, there are about twice as many people in that room as there really is in the criminal profiling unit. We don't do everything. We concentrate on one thing. Uh, forensic biology and DNA. It's easy to see why. In 25 years, we have gone through five incarnations of DNA analysis, five different techniques, each one getting better than the last one. The DNA people are learning all the time. Uh, in drug chemistry, we just had something like 600 new controlled substances come into play over the last five years with all the new designer drugs. So there's no way to learn everything. The, the scientists are really, you know, specific, or uh, they're specific in their field. All right. We do specialize in one discipline. We don't go to crime scenes. I have only been to one crime scene. I regretted it. 
um, because after the officer involved handed me the radio and said stick close to me just in case something bad happens so I'm like I'm not armed and then he took the radio back but handed me a sweating stick of dynamite I'm like yeah, I don't want to go to any more crime scenes so we don't carry guns we're all civilian employees there are a couple of organizations a couple of states where the forensic scientists are sworn even though they're in the laboratory all the time they do carry a gun but that's only a couple of states uh, we have to have at least a Bachelor of Science in the TV shows. They do not stress that. Okay, you've got to have a bachelor's degree. Biology, chemistry, and biochemistry, and molecular biology, cellular, bi cellular biology are some of the best majors there are. Uh, we work a case until it's done. We don't stop. It doesn't stop after an hour or a day or a month. There are cases that have gone on for years, and analysts have been on those cases all the way through. I don't know if you remember the Browns Fried Chicken case where seven people were murdered in Palatine, Illinois, at a Browns Fried Chicken. That case went on for close to five years before it was solved. And the same people who started the case ended the case, except for one who actually died in the time the case was going on. But the same people who start, started it finished it. Uh, we go to court. Okay, I said often, that's kind of a misnomer. About 2% of the cases you work, you will go to court on. You're going to get used to speaking in public. You're going to get used to being challenged by attorneys who may or may not know exactly what they're talking about. They ask you questions like they do, but after a while you go, yeah, they, re they must have read an article, and that's all they did. So, you know, you're the expert in the courtroom. So about 2% of the time of your cases, you'll go into court. Um, and you really can't tell. In bio-DNA, you might get a quintuple homicide, and you think, oh, wow, this will end up in court so fast. And that one doesn't go to court. Instead, you go on the burglary case where there was a little bit of blood on a piece of a glass window. And that's the one you go on, you're like, that's so, you know, not really very exciting. But you will end up in court. If you ever hear anybody who's interviewing you for a job say, don't worry, you never go to court, they're lying to you. Okay, you will end up in court. Um, a couple of other things. All the forensic scientists I know are really pretty ethical people, except for the ones, well, there were a couple that weren't, but they're now either in jail or they are, they've been fired and they've disappeared from the face of the earth. We do keep up on the science and try to use good technology in spite of the fact that some of the lawyers and courts would lead you to believe that, you know, we're so far behind in the world that, the, you know, rubbing two sticks together causes a fire. Um, we try very hard to be impartial in the courts because we're not there for the state attorney's office. We're not there for the defense. And both of them are trying to get us to say something. We're just there to tell what our evidence said. I got this evidence. I analyzed it. This is my conclusion. Boom. And after that, the state will say, well, can't you, you, know, can't you state it a little bit more conclusively? Add three more zeros onto that octillion. That'll be really big. And of course, the defense is going, well, can't you eliminate like six or eight zeros from that number and you know, make it a little less specific? And all we can do is say, sorry, those are the stats, and you have to live with it. So we keep constantly learning to keep on top of the discipline. Forensic biology or DNA is actually pretty interesting. The FBI took over management of protocols for forensic biology and DNA. And they actually mandated that for, uh, DNA analysts somehow keep a record of the articles that they read. And they are required to read two articles every month and basically sign a paper saying, I've read this article and I understand it. And that's how they keep up on top of DNA. Other sections are a little bit more loose on that. Um, but DNA, it's required because they want the analyst to be right on the top of the discipline. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about the mainstream sections in forensic labs. Um, you may have heard I, Bones is like forensic anthropology. Okay. 
there aren't many forensic anthropologists. I mean, there are forensic anthropologists out there, but most of them are university professors who do forensics on the side. There are a lot of forensic odontologists who are dentists who do forensics on the side. We're going to talk about the people in just about every forensic lab there is. So drug chemistry, biology, DNA, fingerprints, firearms, trace, toxicology, and question documents. Um, with that in mind, where all of the folks involved actually learn a couple of things. They learn that you have to avoid contamination, you have to avoid losing your sample, and you have to avoid degradation of the sample. Everybody knows this and everybody watches it in the laboratory. Okay, contamination especially with DNA is a huge factor. I have seen whole DNA sections closed down while they scrub the place out and try to remove an errant contaminant that they've got in some place because with PCR analysis now, your contaminant gets cloned exactly the same as your sample gets cloned. So if you have a weak sample, suddenly the contaminant is huge. And they're, it's just they find a contaminant, the lab gets closed down, they start scrubbing. And they scrub until they do not get that contaminant anymore. Um, some of the samples you get, you want to make sure you don't lose. Because that might be all you've got. They're at the point now where they can get a DNA sample or a DNA profile off of six cells. It's basically, they're looking at something smaller than the size of a pinhead. And if you try to pick that out and suddenly it blows off into the air, that might have been all the DNA you had. Suddenly the case is gone. Uh, we watch out for degradation of the sample. DNA is not so much involved there unless you get wet blood in a plastic bag. Then that doesn't work very well because it rots. Um, but nice brown paper bag, dried blood, DNA will stay in, intact for years and years and years. So we just, we, everybody tries to avoid that. All right. Well, going way back in history, I thought I would show you this. This is the first and only Illinois State Police Mobile Crime Laboratory. Um, it was a school bus. It was armor-plated. It had bulletproof glass. The tires were solid rubber tires, so nobody could shoot the tires out. And you can't see it here, but here you can see this little turret that while they're driving down the road is actually cranked down into the bus. When you stop, you crank the turret up on the bus. The, there are a couple little holes that you can see. Those are for the machine guns because you want to keep the evidence safe and secure. So they had a trooper in the turret with a machine gun and they could crank the turret around 360 degrees and that was some, the laboratory. Unfortunately, this did not get used very much because the bus was so heavy by the time you got the armor plating, bulletproof glass, solid rubber tires, machine gun, and all the laboratory equipment inside, that when it traveled down the road, it left furrows in the road. So you can see where this thing went. Someplace that bus still exists. I want to find it. I want to buy it. I want to put it in my backyard. Okay, just because. Um, this is the inside. It doesn't show up very well, but the, the analyst here actually did everything. They had a rowboat in case they had to go out into lakes. They had a fingerprint station, a firearm station. They had scuba gear. They had uh, preliminary testing for drugs. They could test for blood and blood type because that's all they did at that point in time. So basically they could do the mainstream forensics if they wanted to. All right, moving along. We actually are in bit, nice stationary labs now. Uh, trace analysis is a small section usually in laboratories. And the evidence that they get, of course, is small, trace. They handle things like tablets, or sorry, they handle things like unknown powders, um, unknown substances, hairs, fibers, explosives, glass, soil, you name it. If it's small and can be easily transferred, these folks analyze it. They have all the cool toys in the laboratory. They're the ones who utilize scanning electron microscopy, um, uh, Fourier transform uh, microspectrophotometry, GCMS, GC of all kinds, LC, X-ray diffraction, nuclear, uh, sorry, uh, nuclear, no. Yeah, nuclear magnetic resonance. I mean, they have all the cool toys. 
that they use. Why? Because they analyze just about anything. A piece of glass comes in. They may have to try and figure out if a certain piece of glass might have come from a certain window. If fibers come in, they want to find out did this fiber possibly come from a particular type of carpet. They can't tell if it came from the particular carpet, but they can say, you know what, it looks like it could have come from that type of carpet. Then they have to figure out how common that carpet is in the area they're dealing with. Uh, they deal with some funny things. There actually was a case once that came into the laboratory. It was just dead grass. And the police officer said, I really hate to do this to you, but I have to submit this dead grass. And they're like, no problem, we'll try it. What happened? Apparently the mayor of this particular suburb was not very popular. He woke up one morning, opened his window on his bright green lawn that had a four-letter word burned into it. All right? And he didn't like it. And the letter, you know, it was like six-foot-tall letters. And he's like, I want you to find out who killed my grass in a four-letter word. I want you to have them arrested, tried, convicted, and jailed. So the guy's like, unfortunately, I had to bring it in. It was no problem. They looked at the grass. What they found out was somebody had just massively, massively overdosed the grass with fertilizer, just burned it. So they actually found the type of fertilizer. The police chief went back to the garden shed of the mayor. They found the exact same fertilizer in the garden shed. It was the gardener. So they found that out. Um, another time they had a case where somebody brought a coffee pot in. And it's like, yeah, got a coffee pot. People drank the coffee pot. Uh, said that tastes a little weird. They felt a little bit nauseous afterwards. They're like, okay, what can be in a coffee pot? So they looked, and there was a little bit of liquid left in the coffee pot. They pulled it out. They did some testing on it. And they found things like creatinine and a few amino acids and a little bit of urea. And by the time they got all the way down the list, they came up with all the components of urine. And so they said, yeah, we think somebody peed in the coffee pot. And so they sent back the note. It was a small company. There were only like 20 people in the company. The owner, who had consumed part of this coffee, called the polygraph examiner in from the state, set him up behind a desk, and said, I am going to polygraph every one of you until I find out who peed in the coffee pot. And apparently somebody stood up and said, I peed in your coffee pot. You all treated me like dirt. I hope you enjoyed your coffee. Goodbye. And they left. So there they were able to find out what happened to the coffee. So they do all kinds of really you know, interesting types of analysis. Um, gunshot residue is done by these folks. They're the ones who can find out if a person possibly was at a scene of a crime when a gun was fired or if they fired the gun. They can't tell the difference yet. They're working on that. But it's like we can you know, it's like we can tell you either were standing next to the guy who fired the gun or you fired the gun. Which is it? And a lot of times people will say, Oh, I didn't fire it, but I'll tell you who did. So they're looking at residues left on the clothing and skin of victims and suspects. Um, sometimes if they have a ref, uh, uh, residues on a victim, they actually can try and figure out how far away from the barrel of the gun the victim was when they were shot. And that can actually sometimes destroy alibis in cases. So they're looking with gun, or at gunshot residues. Here's what they're looking at. This is what they're going to look at on the victim to see how far away from the barrel of a gun they were. If you see that this actually is expanding as it you know, comes out from the barrel of the gun, as it travels, it loses things. It loses smoke first, then it loses, um, well actually no, it loses red, lead residue first, then it loses smoke. The last thing it loses are burned gunshot particles. So by the presence of either smoke or lead or gunshot particles and how big the pattern is, they can tell how far away a victim was from the barrel of a gun when, it, when they were shot. This actually is what they're going to look at on the victim or on the suspect's hands. And if they've got particles of residue that include barium, antimony, and lead, they know that person either fired the gun or they were standing next to the person who did, because that does spread out as well. So those are some of the gunshot residues. Um, this actually is uh, a test that they made up. A shotgun, or someone was shot with a, a shotgun, and they were trying to figure out how far away from the end of the barrel of the shotgun the, the victim was. So here was something that was very close. You notice everything's a very nice, compact pattern. 
and this was a little further away and so you can see the hole is bigger and you can see that pellets are spread out a little further so they actually were able to figure out how far away from the barrel of the shotgun the person was when they were killed and that actually kind of eliminated an alibi in the case because the person was like, you know, saying it was stupid, but we were like arguing over the shotgun and we were both holding on to the shotgun and all of a sudden the shotgun went off and my friend is dead. Okay, well with that you would expect a pattern somewhat like that and that wasn't the pattern. It was something like that, which actually occurred from about 10 to 15 feet away. So unless somebody had like eight foot long arms, they were not arguing over the barrel of the shotgun. Oops, I'm sorry. Um, if anybody has any questions at any point in time, let me know. So, like I said, with gunshot residue, su suspect might have fired a gun. They might have been close to somebody who fired a gun. Problems, just as you go through your daily life, it disappears. About six hours after somebody shoots a gun, no more residues on their hands. It will be on their clothes yet, but not on their hands. Um, I actually heard somebody once who was trying to beat the gunshot residue test, and they said they had found on the internet a way to beat the gunshot residue test. And it's like, yeah, you pee on your hands. I'm like, really? And he's like, oh yeah, they said that's the best way to get rid of gunshot residue. I said, you know, I use soap and water, works just as well. So go ahead, you do whatever you want, but I'm gonna use soap and water. Um, on clothing, like I said, that's the gunshot residue. That's going to stay on the clothing until it gets washed. And usually at a crime scene, that clothing is not going to get washed. But if the suspect is wearing it, it might be there until they throw it in the laundry and get the, those clothes washed. After that, the residues are gone. All right, so this actually was some a residue that they put onto SEM. And they found particles. They've identified particles now that actually correspond to certain manufacturers of ammunition. The, the, the explosives they use as the propellants and the primers actually give pretty unique particles. So they can get the shape of the particle using the SEM. Using EDX, they actually can determine the components of the particles. So here they have barium, ant antimony, and lead, and a little bit of aluminum which was part of the, uh, the primer explosive, the high explosive in the primer for the CCI uh, bullets. Okay, hair and fiber. Well, typically it's gonna be class evidence. We have a hair from an individual who has black hair. How many people are those? Yes, the suspect has black hair. Unfortunately, 60% of the population has black hair, so there's not much we can say about it unless they get DNA. Why do they use it? Because it's so easily transferred. Every day you go through life, you lose about 200 hairs. Okay, you're just shedding them as you go through the day. I don't lose so many anymore. Lost them all a long time ago. But you're going to lose about 200 a day. And you don't know it. You don't stop and say, oh, I just felt one fall out. I'm going to pick it up. Same thing happens at crime scenes. Hairs are left behind. Those type of hairs don't necessarily have DNA. The ones that have DNA on them are the ones that somebody pulls out of a suspect. I mean, if we see a hank of hair that's got little bloody ends on it, we're going to run DNA on that hair because it's going to tell us exactly whose hair that was. Um, but otherwise, it'll point a direction to a possible suspect. But the stats are so bad, for the most part, brunettes, blondes, you know, 60, 30 percent, something like that, the only really rare uh, type of hair is naturally red hair. Only about 4% of the world has naturally red hair. So that, that narrows it down a little bit. Um, but we can exonerate somebody really quick. If we've got a hair from a crime scene that's blonde and they bring us a brunette suspect, we say, yeah, wrong suspect, bring us a blonde. So they know immediately, okay, get rid of the suspect, we've got the wrong one. All right. Um, we see them in sexual assaults, hit and runs, murders, burglaries. I mean, you know, just because they're left behind. Hit and run cases, there are times that we have collected hairs. If the victim has been hit hard enough and they've hit the windshield, we find their hair stuck in the glass of the windshield, which actually serves as kind of a cross point of evidence because oftentimes we find glass particles in the scalp of the victim. 
So we've got glass from the windshield in the victim, hairs and usually blood from the victim on the windshield. That's going to tie the car to the victim and the accident, even if they run away from it. Okay, in sample collection, they used to do it like this. Yeah, I, you know, they actually have gone a, a lot better now. When people collect trace evidence, they are gowned top to bottom. They're not, you know, he's obviously shedding hairs into his evidence there, um, but they're gowned from head to toe. They actually use tape now so that they can actually use a big piece of tape and tape the whole object. Once they get done taping the object, they fold the tape in half. All their evidence is contained. It's not going to get contaminated. It's not going to get lost. They can put it under a microscope, look at all the evidence there, find say, there's a weird hair that shouldn't be there. They can use a scalpel, slice along the hair, pull it out, mount it on a slide, flatten the tape. Everything is all sealed and ready to go. So they've elim eliminated loss and contamination uh, in the trace cases. And that used to be the biggest problem with trace, was contamination of materials. All right, uh, paint analysis, I forgot paints. They do paints, again, it's a statistical uh, type of analysis. You've got a car that has been hit, and on the car you've got some odd color paint that's not the same as the car. You can analyze the paint, figure out what type of car hit the parked car. It may be like, I don't know, a green 2005 Toyota. Now you've got it narrowed down to all the green 2005 Toyotas there are, and you can start looking for a suspect vehicle at that point in time. That's usually as far as we can get. Model year, color of car, okay, for a hit and run case. Um, here, paint can be used in burglaries. If somebody uses a, a pry bar and they pry a door open, if they leave any paint behind, we can tell them this is black paint and Stanley uses that type of paint as compared to, you know, craftsmen. So look for a Stanley pry bar uh, type thing. Okay, there are like two billion Stanley pry bars out there, but at least you have a direction to look. And that's what they do with hit and runs and, burg and burglaries. Um, the big thing for uh, paint analysis, all cars now have four layers of paint. They actually match all four layers by just looking at the color layer sequence and then they dissect them and analyze every component of the paint. What actually works well for us is if somebody repaints their car, their green 2005 Toyota, that they have repainted blue. Okay, that extra blue layer cuts down on statistics. How many green 2005 Toyotas have been repainted blue with this particular type of paint? Okay, that can help us out a lot. So again, they, like I said, Trace has all the cool toys. Um, they do arson and explosives. They try to help determine, well, they determine if there's an accelerant present. Okay, they're not the ones who say this was an arson. All the Trace people say is, yeah, samples, gasoline. Okay, uh, on the carpet of the house that burned down. Usually you don't find gasoline laying around the house on the carpet floor. So they will help with that uh, by you know, telling if there's an accelerant present. So with, uh, they look at accelerant residues. There are a lot of ways that people test in the field. Of all of these, dogs are the best to test for residues. And dogs are being used more and more in cases. But what you have to remember is, dogs are usually only trained in one thing. Um, if you remember the landslide out in the Pacific Northwest, they had most of the cadaver dogs in like the Western United States out there looking for bodies. Um, they didn't have, they don't have the arson dogs, they don't have the accelerant or you know, the explosive dogs or the drug dogs that it would just confuse them. So you train a dog to do one thing and then they do that well. Um, so explosives, well, they look for explosives uh, as well. Most of the bomb cases go to alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, but trace sections may get cases that have already detonated bombs and they'll look for the explosive that might be present. So those are for testing, again, all of the instruments they have. All right, this is probably what you're more interested in. Uh, bio, forensic biology and DNA analysis, testing for body fluids. 
Blood, uh, the number one body fluid that gets tested for. There are more murders out there than most anything else. Number two and three, seminal fluid and vaginal fluids in sexual assault cases. We see these in about equal amounts. Saliva is number four. Urine, fecal material, and gastric contents are somewhere down a lot lower. What's going to happen in a case that comes in for forensic biology and DNA? The biologists will look for the stains, tell what type of stain is present. After that, goes almost immediately to DNA analysis. DNA is the conclusive test in forensics because it will tell you if the body fluid is human and give you a genetic profile and statistics as to how common it is. Usually if there's a suspect, it will tell you yes or no, that is not the, or is or is not the suspect. So 25 years. At one point in time in the 1980s, it took two months to do a case. Uh, from start to finish. We needed a DNA stain about the size of a quarter and we could get odds in the hundreds of millions. Uh, PCR came about in the 90s. That took about two to three weeks to do analysis. Unfortunately, the odds dropped to about one in a million. We could do it faster. We only needed a stain the size of a dime, but they were doing loci, or loci in genes that were not very polymorphic. Um, so we kind of took a step backwards. Of course, now we do STR analysis on all of our samples. Uh, that came in late 90s, early 2000s. Now they can get a case done in two days. In 25 years, they've gone from two months to two days. They've gone from a DNA stain the size of a quarter to a stain the size of a pinhead. They've gone from one in 100 million to they get you know quadrillions, septillions, octillions on a daily basis. And that's with only 13 loci. Okay, they look at 13 loci now. By the end of the year, I think most every forensic lab is going to have switched to a 16 locus uh, kit for analysis. Just add like another nine zeros onto the end of those. And there's a company out there now that's making the 24 locus kit. So if you can get 24 loci that match, it's, you know, the odds are astronomical. Well, they already are. Um, we're doing mitochondrial DNA sometimes. If we only get a skeleton, no nuclear DNA left behind. The well, problem with mitochondrial DNA is it only traces maternal bloodlines. So if you've got a case where you've got, you know, like my missing brother, and they find a skeleton, which they're not supposed to find, and they say, we think this is your missing brother, well, we'll, you know, give DNA, and they will be able to find out if it's the same maternal bloodline as the rest of the siblings. And we'll say, oh, it is. Um, why STRs? A lot of sexual assault cases, there are two male profiles present. There may be a consensual partner within 72 hours of an attack. That gives us two male profiles. Looking at them, we're not going to be able to separate the profiles. We can separate the, los or the, the alleles at the locuses we're looking at, but then uh, you know, defense attorneys like to use every different combination of loci that you can get to dilute the statistics. And a lot of times it's going to dilute them a lot. So looking at the Y or STRs in the Y chromosome, you can differentiate and say these are the two Y chromosomes that are present. This one belongs to the consensual partner. This one belongs to the suspect. And now you can eliminate some of those odd combinations of loci that might be present. And the statistics come back to being good. So this is pretty much what everybody is doing in the field now for forensic biology and DNA. Uh, of course, everything is now run with capillary electrophoresis. So the sample size is small. And everything now is put on CODIS for you know, uh, trying to identify a suspect. They started CODIS because they had done studies and found out that you know, people who perform sex, sex crimes have a recidivism rate of over 75%. So 75% of the time, person gets out of jail, they go commit another sex crime. If they're on CODIS, now we already have a sample for them. At one point in time, if we, you know, before CODIS, if somebody brought us in a DNA kit or a sexual assault kit and said, we don't have a suspect, we couldn't do anything with that kit until they gave us a suspect. We'd say, hold the kit, when you get a suspect, we'll analyze it. Now we don't have to do that. We can analyze it immediately. The suspect, even though he's not known, could already be on file. And if he's not on file, that unknown profile is going to sit in CODIS every month it goes through and searches CODIS again. 
because we're adding new people continually into CODIS. In Illinois alone, we add something like 3,000 new people a month into CODIS. Right now, that may seem like a lot, and you're thinking 3,000 new sex offenders a month in Illinois. In Illinois, they passed a law so that now all felons need to be on CODIS. So it's 3,000 felons and sex offenders. And that's still quite a lot, isn't it? Well, anyway, okay. You'll, we just live in a bad state. All right. This is a, a, a standard ladder. These are all the low side, that, or all the alleles for the low side they're looking at for 10 of them. And you can see why we get such great statistics. By the time you start looking at a locus that has 11 different alleles, and you're looking at all the different possible combinations of those alleles, there, this really cuts down on the number of people that are going to have any particular combination of alleles. The stats are really very good. So if you look at nearly all these, there are a lot of alleles. Okay, except at the amylogenin gene where we only have X or Y. But that lets us know exactly the sex of the individual the sample came from. When we start, first started doing DNA, we did a, an, an extraction for the male and an extraction for the female, and we just kind of put it into faith that this is the male DNA and that's the female DNA. Now we know, okay, if we just get a peak that's only X, we know that came from a female. If we get something that has X and Y, it came from a male. So we're absolutely sure where the DNA came from. Um, so. Here we had just, it was a case. Uh, they had the, let's see, the victim and the suspect and the crime scene. The first thing they do is pattern match. Okay, which pattern looks like the crime scene, suspect or victim? In this case, I think it's the suspect. Now that you've matched the suspect, you do the statistics. Figure out what are the odds of any other person having this particular profile, except of course an identical twin. So that's exactly what they'll do. Now the great thing is, with CODIS, you've got the computerized search, you've got all the sex offenders and all the felons on file, um, you can get no suspect cases in. We're basically t doing every case that comes into the laboratory at this point in time. I mean, and by law now, every agency is mandated to bring in every case. They can't hold cases back. So apparently at one point in time there were something like, something like 8,000 cases across the state of Illinois that uh, police agencies had just held on to. For some reason they're like, eh, we don't need this analyzed. Now a law passed and all those cases have to be analyzed and every case that comes in now will be analyzed at a laboratory. So there's always going to be jobs. All right. Big thing to remember though, DNA analysis will not tell the difference between identical twins. That's why we have fingerprints. Fingerprints will. And principles of fingerprints, no two people have ever been found with identical fingerprints. They have not even found two fingers with identical fingerprints on them. Uh, they're pretty permanent unless you do something really weird to your fingers to like try and destroy the, the fingerprints. And they're pretty easy to classify. So the problem with fingerprints is and here we have fingerprint from a case. I know if you've watched CSI, every unknown print that comes in from a crime scene is perfect, right? This is what they normally look like. And actually, this is a pretty good one. And here's the inked print. This is the one they compare against. So they actually go through and try to find enough uh, information that coincides between the two prints with no differences, because the difference between the two prints You've got, a different, you've got a different finger. So they can actually classify and identify a person. Um, this was, oh, sorry, this was just another picture. Right, DNA has CODIS, fingerprints have APHIS. Every fingerprint card that is collected goes into APHIS. Now if we have an unknown fingerprint from a scene of a crime, scan it, feed it into APHIS, it actually can compare one print to five million prints per second. And in the morning when you come back into work, you have a list of possible suspects. You'll pull all the fingerprint cards for all the suspects and go look at them and see if you've got a matching fingerprint. Um, you might, it might be one of those 10, it might not be. 
Maybe again you've got a new burglar who's never been fingerprinted before. But the same thing happens. That unknown fingerprint sits in the database and goes through every month and gets searched against new people who've come into the database. So this has really helped with fingerprints. Um, drugs, okay, here we have cannabis, cocaine, and different hallucinogens to include, I don't know, some, uh, let's see, this will, these are all forms of ecstasy that have been out there. So the drugs, oh, here are some more hallucinogens, LSD in a lot of different forms. They do more than just hallucinogens. There are other drugs out there. Here we have rohypnol, uh, roofies, and this was the original form of the roofie, which got really bad rap as a date rape drug. And so what happened was Hoffman LaRoche changed the formulation from this to this, so that now the, if anybody drops the green tablet in somebody's drink, it actually turns blue. There's a blue dye in the tablet. So if you leave your drink alone and come back and now it's blue, you can say, who roofied my drink, and see who turns red, because it's pretty obvious. Bad thing, rohypnol is the only benzodiazepine that they changed the formulation to. There is no dye in Xanax or Valium or any of the other benzodiazepines. So now people who are intent on committing date rape just use other benzodiazepines instead of rohypnol. The reason they used rohypnol is because basically it like was a memory wipe. I mean, for people, they just, when the drug went into effect, their memory was really pretty bad. The other benzos don't have that same amnesic effect. They have all the other same effects. You know, disinhibition, uh, loss of anxiety, sedation, muscle relaxation, but they don't all have that amnesic effect the way the rohypnol did. So they're just switching over to other benzos. GHB got a bad rap as a, a date rape drug. Not so much, but the reason it got a bad rap was because people died when they were dosed. There were actually a couple people in Illinois many years ago who two young ladies were going out with two guys and it was their first date. And the two guys had decided that they were going to dose these two girls with GHB. Unfortunately, they didn't decide who was going to dose the girls with GHB, so they both did. And two doses will kill you. And both girls died. So that's that's one of the reasons GHB is not used much. Yes? Now what was Rufinol prescribed for? Do what? Is Rufinol prescribed to anything? Uh, Rohypnol is kind of like the Xanax of South America. So they give it like we get Xanax here. It's not used in the United States. Food and Drug Administration has not approved it for use or manufacture in the United States. So it's, you know, it's, it's a drug that in, is found in Europe, it's found in South America, but FDA has not approved it here. Hmm? So it's smuggled here. Yeah, basically it's smuggled. Or somebody goes south of the border, buys some on a prescription, brings it back. Okay, the drugs that we see the most, cocaine, cannabis, methamphetamine, heroin, hallucinogens, including ecstasy, the designer drugs, all the cannabimimetic drugs, the bath salts, the, the K2, the spice, all of those drugs. Most of them now are controlled substances. There's all Schedule One drugs. But as soon as we schedule them, the people who are manufacturing them have a chemist who's you know, got the next iteration of the drugs. They just put out a new drug out that's not controlled. And what I thought was really funny on this one list was that it was for one of the bath salts. And there was a list that said, we certify that these bath salts do not contain the following. And it was all the schedule, the scheduled bath salt. But they did not tell people what compound was in the bath salts. All they said is, we assure you, these aren't in them. Okay, this is legal. And they keep changing all the time. So we're going to be keeping up with that for years. Toxicology. Once people take the drugs, and if they take too much, bad things happen. Um, we, the difference between drug chemistry and toxicology, we see more drugs. The drug chemists are only interested in controlled substances. Toxicology is interested in any drug that can possibly impair a person. Uh, we see metabolites. Sometimes the drug metabolizes and we don't see the parent. Cocaine. Well, let's go heroin. If we see heroin in a sample, the person is dead. Okay, because they died before their body had the time to break it down, which is only a few minutes. 
So we are only going to see metabolites in some cases. So we have a lot more drugs to look at. Uh, the matrix is not as clean. We have blood, urine, body organs, and the drug chemist has tablets, powders, capsules. Uh, concentration is less. With drug chemistry, it's like, I don't know, 5% of the sample is cocaine. Here, it's parts per million of cocaine. So we actually you know, have a, a different type of matrix. Um, they also look for volatile substances, ethanol. People are driving while they've been drinking, and it's not usually a good thing. Sometimes if they can't get ethanol, they drink methanol, usually by accident, or isopropanol. This isn't...